Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Insecurity. We are on episode 18, and we want to talk about the results of the day we fight back. And if you don't know, which you should know, the day we fight back is a day to protest all the NSA spying and mass surveillance and everything the government is either trying to change or trying to implement without asking us and seeing if we're really okay with any of this. So once again, drawn, joined by Tom Webster, and he's going to really break down these numbers for us. Yeah, unfortunately, the numbers are fairly high level, um, and we can't, we won't really see the outcome of this for, you know, at least weeks or months ahead of right now, uh, simply because it's it's up to legislators. And as we all know, um, if you're at all familiar with American politics, it takes forever to get anything done in Congress. Well. Remember, this is now the second protest, the second large-scale protest. The first one being two years ago around this time for SOPA and PIPA, where yeah. we, I mean, we had, this was really well known, we had everyone doing stuff. Here was sort of a more grassroots attempt where people said, hey, let's protest, let's do this. And I think that we got, I, I'm looking at these numbers, it seems like a pretty good turnout to me. Yeah, definitely. And it's... So SOPA and PIPA was uh, really interesting when you look at it from a protest standpoint. It was really one of the first, one of the first giant online collaboration protests where everyone said, "Hey, look, they are fighting the internet itself, and we need to bring it down on them." With this, I mean, so mass surveillance is a huge issue, but we have to admit it's a little bit more nuanced. If mass surveillance continues to go on, the internet as we know it isn't going to be destroyed. With SOPA and PIPA there's a chance that it could have fundamentally changed things for us. It could have fundamentally broken the way we use the internet today. So I think that's one of the reasons we didn't get such a big turnout. Even still, the turnout was, you know, fairly sizable. So uh, from some of the numbers here, 37 million people saw the uh, Day We Fight Back banner. And it, it wasn't, you know, this tiny little bar at the bottom of the screen that said, hey, the day we fight back, fight against mass surveillance, this thing took up like a third of your window size on a web page. So I was, as a guy who runs a couple of websites and has put this banner up, I, I was looking at it just like, I, I don't know how I feel about that. This banner is awfully intrusive. But then I got to think, yeah, but I mean, what is what are we really doing here? Uh, what's more important? Is someone seeing my site for one day more important than striking down the NSA? And the answer is obvious. We, we've got to fight back against mass surveillance. So 37 million people saw that banner, which is pretty good. That's a, a decent amount of people. Well, before we continue with the numbers, here's the problem. On both sides, we have bipartisan... I mean, this is not a Republican-Democrat thing. You have half of the Republicans are for security and the other half are not. You have half the Democrats that are for security and half that are not. You have to get to those people that are in charge of the, the Senate subcommittee that deals with uh, security and spying. And it's hard to convince people who want to be safe because the whole point of this podcast is to say, hey, wait a second, let's show you how to be secure. And for them to say, well, you know what, I don't mind giving some security or some privacy up if it's really going to work. And we have no number, I mean, we have we have white papers that said, no, it doesn't work, but it's not getting, it's not on the nightly news. There's no nightly news thing that says, hey, wait a second, we haven't caught anybody using these tactics. I mean, we, right. all we have is a 60 Minutes puff piece that says the NSA is, uh, is watching us. Right. Uh, from what everyone knows, and, you know, I, we, we have to admit, these people... Uh, the people that work at the NSA, the people that work at the intelligence subcommittees, they're not evil people. They're not bad people. And I'm sure all they want is to keep the country safe. All they want is to prevent terrorist attacks and to make sure Americans at home and abroad are kept safe. Now, you know, the conspiracy theorist in me is screaming out and saying, no, no, they're trying to take over everyone and they're watching us all. It's going to be like that one Will Smith movie where that guy is blackmailing everyone. And yeah, I guess that could happen. But realistically, they're probably going after the same thing we are, you know, keeping ourselves safe, making sure we're all secure and fighting bad guys. And who could say no to that? The issue is they're going about it in the completely wrong way. And it's unconstitutional. It goes against the Fourth Amendment, and it infringes upon the First Amendment. If if you can't have an anonymous press, if you can't have some form of 
it's just getting your words out there anonymously without it being traced back to you, without things being captured in a dragnet surveillance to trace it back to you, democracy falls apart. And we saw that during the American Revolution. We saw a lot of published papers, a lot of really powerful stuff being published under pseudonyms, under uh, you know anonymous, under authors that were completely unknown because they were made up, because people didn't want it getting traced back to them, and then you know the king could come by and lop their heads off. So a free, unencumbered press is really the cornerstone of democracy, and we're starting to lose that. With the NSA mass surveillance, it is quite literally almost impossible to keep your sources secret, which is, again, you go back to Watergate, you go back to a lot of big scandals that the press has broken up about the government, and having those secure sources was the foundation of their work, and we need to protect that. And like we said, and like I, it's not that I, I mean, my conversations to Tom most of the time, who cares who gets it? The conversations to my wife, the conversations back and forth between coworkers, I, I, I really don't care. But at some point, I want to know that if I need to have a private conversation, I can without people listening in, without people doing this, because I'm not doing anything wrong. And and we're not saying here is the thing we're not saying if you if you if we have probable cause to not go after you if you have probable cause absolutely let's go but the average american there is no probable cause they're just collecting it just in case and i think that's what people don't understand it's the fact that they're collecting your phone records just in case at some point later down the road you uh, you're you're in a place you shouldn't be by accident and now they're now you're a blip on their radar and they're going after you and that's and I think people are just forgetting that because we said after remember we said after 9-11 never again we never want it and then we started with uh, we want the national ID card and I and I railed against that because now the police at any time can say where's your ID card and people said right well so what and I go no if I'm walking down the street on a public street I shouldn't have to randomly this is like in New York stop and frisk that they're complaining about you shouldn't have to randomly without probable cause be asked and harassed by the police or by anybody without without somebody saying we have reason to believe so that's right. the whole and crux it's it's not it's not even uh, theoretical at this point I mean it's happened there are stories of people you know, being charged with something, and there are stories that have broken now where the DEA does this uh, constructive investigation where they say, okay, we've got this guy doing this thing, now let's go backwards. And they've used data that the NSA has gathered. They've used this collected dragnet data to then lump more charges onto, this pe onto these people. They didn't see it. They're not going about the police process in the, in the right way. And they admitted, yeah, no, we do this all the time. We just, you know, we catch someone for one thing and then we connect the dots in the hopes that we might get them for something else because it makes us look good. It makes us look like we're putting away bad guys. In police training courses, they rail against this kind of thing. They said, okay, look, you've got somebody for this thing or you don't or you suspect someone. When you're looking through the evidence, your brain wants to connect dots. Be wary of this. Do not connect the dots unless it makes sense and always, always have an adversary. Always have someone that is challenging your every move and making you explain every little detail of you believing someone's guilty of something. And that's one of the things that the day we fight back is calling to do. It's calling to put a public adversary, a public advocate in the FISA courts to say, no, that's not right and here's why, instead of the FISA courts having a rubber stamp. We saw something after this protest which was amazing. The FISA court is starting to question what the government is asking them to do. So the government comes to them with a document, and before it was just, yep, terrorism, fighting them, protect the children, stamp, good, done, next. And it wasn't really even a court process. It was just someone signing the bottom of a letter and handing it on to the next guy. It was, I struggle to call it corruption, but, you know, what else can you call it? So now the FISA courts are looking at this, and they're going, okay, all right, this isn't quite correct. We should probably start taking a closer look at this stuff and they're starting to push back a little bit on the government, which is good. It's great. And we're finally getting the word out. Well, I understand the whole point. So so Google and all the bigger tech companies are, are petitioning the government to tell the people 
how many requests they get in a month, in a year, in some X amount of time period. And the government was saying no. And and I understand if they're going, if somebody's going after you, you don't want Google to send you an email saying, "Hey, we're we're releasing this information to the government." Then then you're. If they're going after you, you're going to start deleting and encrypting and doing whatever you need to do to del to destroy this information. But I don't understand why it was so difficult for them to say we've got a hundred thousand letters last month of information. So it can it can it can absolutely scare people to say, hey, wait a second, why did Verizon get? a hundred thousand letters why did Google get a hundred and fifty thousand letters what's going on what are they looking for and that that in your mind knowing is a way to say hey I gotta start being careful remember right. remember it's a free service everything we use from from the internet to the cell phone to the internet all of those you're pay, either paying for or it's not yours you didn't create the infrastructure so if, the government is somehow subsidizing this, therefore, they have to comply. Right, and what these letters say, what the, the FISA court letters say, what the national security letters say, is they all come with these gag orders. So when they hand the, this pile of, you know, these pile of letters to Google and they say, hey, look, all of your Gmail users or this large subset of Gmail users that we really only need this one guy, but we're going to ask for way more than we need just because you know, we want that, but by the way, you're not allowed to say anything to anyone, ever, no matter what, because it's in the interest of national security. And we've, we've got to go back to what we said at the start of this. There have been white papers, there have been people that have come forward, there have been anonymous sources from inside the NSA itself that have said, yeah, look, we don't actually catch anyone with this stuff. We don't actually stop any terrorist attacks. There was one maybe kind of half thing that we might have stopped, and then, you know, people dug into it and they said, actually, no, the FBI did that with good old-fashioned police work. That's how we stopped that guy from, you know, bombing New York. So we really need to be vigilant, and we need to look at what are we giving away and what are we getting back. To us, as American citizens and as citizens of the world, we're giving up so much. What are we getting in return? This is a terrible deal. We're not any safer. They haven't caught any criminals. Why are we giving them this information? It's like if you know, if you're shoveling over money to someone and they they give you a gumball, and you're just like, that's it. That's what well, we have. What I what I don't understand. Mm. Now I lost my train of thought. It, but it's you have all this stuff, like you said. What are we getting back? And what is this doing? I mean. They're collecting all this for what? It's like the biggest episode of Hoarders that we know, hoping that in 10 years or whatever it is, and they're, what they're hoping is that people are too lazy to invoke security. And, and as people get burned by this, as the more target breaches, the more credit card hacks, the more this, the more that, people are just going to start saying, let me start thinking about what I should do so this doesn't happen again. Think about it. I bet you there are people that had to go back five and six times for different credit cards because they did shop at Target. Then they got a new credit card. Then they hit up Neiman Marcus, and then they hit up the other one, and then the third one. And now they're getting all these credit cards. What's going on? So now they're going to say, oh, let me check again. Let me do this. Let me, let me start thinking about all this. And with those news stories that keep on saying, change your passwords, this got hacked, or their friend's uh, Facebook got hacked and they had to change your password, now they're starting to realize, and it's just going to make it harder. So instead of just saying, instead of trying to do due diligence and really trying to mesh out the kinks, let's just collect everything and we'll deal with it later. Right. What, what we need to really start looking at is, so the post office in its inception it was well known and it was one of the one of the really great principles of uh, the founding of America and they said okay look the mail is protected this is a protected right this these are private communiques this is business traffic this is everything that we could have access to but we can't allow that we can't allow ourselves to have access to that and 
the founders of America built a system. They built a system of compensating control around the post office that says if the government wants to read your mail, they have to go through so much. It's insane. They've got to go through you know subpoenas and warrants, and they've got to actually really legally prove that they need access to read your mail. Uh, otherwise, it's a federal crime. It's a federal statute that they would be going against. We need to start looking at internet traffic being protected in the same way, with the same compensating control, with the same protection. The good news is, if it never happens, technologists have got a way around this. We'll just encrypt everything to the hilt. And yeah, there are people who say, but the NSA can break anything. I don't think that's true. I don't really believe that. And I, I think that through good, publicly verified encryption, we can stop this whole thing dead. You're right, and uh, and and we just got the problem is we have to educate, and we have to go from there, and and we have to people have to want to do it, and so far, I'm looking at these numbers and I'm impressed. I want to go back to the numbers. 37 million people saw the banner. I don't really hold stock in that because you know what, 37 million people were trying to get Flappy Bird on that day as well. Yeah. But I do look at 89,000 phone calls. That's huge. 89,000 phone calls. So what I did, I'm a school teacher. I showed this to my students. I didn't play the video. I just said, hey, look, I try not to bring politics into the classroom because that's not my job. I'm a, I'm a job. I teach my students programming. Politics is not there. And, and you don't want to offend anybody, whatever it is. So I just said, hey, look, why don't you go to this website? Why don't you read what it's about? Let me give you a brief overview. And let me tell you the good and the bad. And I told them, hey, look. We didn't want another 9-11, so if you're okay with collecting everything, then then okay, that's great for you. But if you're not, look at this. And I, talk, I told them the difference between sending an email and phone calling. And to see 89,000 phone calls, I mean, that's a lot of phone calls. Yes, it is. And to see that's... here 7,000, oh, sorry, 7,000 went uh, not or didn't go through, that's also a lot of phone calls. <laughs> People saying, you know what? Uh, we got we got the point. This is bad. And uh, so so I I made my call and I was surprised. I was really surprised. And this is like one of the only times I've seen this. Um, before you know we had to, they gave you a list of phone numbers and they gave you a script and you would call the phone number, say the script, and hang up and call another phone number and say the script. With this, all you had to do was like is hit a key and it di it hung up that call and automatically dialed the next person. And so I, I called, I'm, I'm in Dayton, Ohio, and I called up my representatives, I called up everyone, and the, uh, the main guy, the, my, my senator for my area, I called him and he said, yeah, look, or well, his aide said, yeah, look, he's, he's already a co-sponsor on the bill, you're like a way far ahead in line, everyone has been calling me about this all day long, um, he gets it, and yeah, he agrees with you, so you win. I said, all right, cool, thanks. And, I, took uh, a, I took it a different way. So I told my students to call, and they're all, they're all hesitant. And I said, remember, you pay these people salaries. Their mm -hmm. job is to advocate for you. So if you're mad about anything, call them. It's their job to listen. If you're yep. mad that there's a pothole outside your house, call them. If you're mad that your property tax are too high, call them. If you're mad that they're not saving the whales, call them. Call them for whatever. If you're, if you're bored, it's their job to entertain you. And so I had a few students that told me they called. I didn't do what you did. I just called because, I mean, I have the, I have the phone numbers here because I work with the town. And I, I, didn't, and I just called and I said, here, here's what the problem is. And uh, I want you to just take note and this is my opinion and that's it. Yeah, and it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the great things that's really, you know, the best thing about a representative democracy is you've got someone you can yell at, and if they don't vote your way, you can fire them. That's the greatest part about this. Now, part of me says I really wish we had a direct democracy, but then I think about, you know, do I really trust my fellow human beings to take care of other fellow human beings? Politics aside, it's great to be able to call someone and, you know, voice your opinion, yell at them, and make yourself known. It's it's then I see three hundred and one thousand signatures. Hopefully, we got over what is the number one hundred and twenty thousand or a hundred thousand on the change.org mm -hmm. site. I don't know yeah. what's the there's a magic number to get the the White House to look at it. Yeah, and it's 
I, I really, I've got mixed feelings about those. On one hand, it's a fantastic idea that, you know, we can now, we've got an online system to petition the federal government and make whatever we want to make known, known, and they have to respond to it. On the other hand, for quite literally every hot issue, every push-button issue that gets people riled up and they sign these petitions and they send them off, a, uh, a lowly paid White House intern has to write the most politically neutral statement ever seen in mankind and say, here's our non-stance on the issue. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to make any opinions. We're just going to admit that there are two sides to this issue. And it, it hurts me because we're petitioning you to make a change. The thing, it's change.org. Come on. And there's, there's no change. It's well, they couldn't build the Death it. Star. Just remember, they couldn't build the Death Star because it would cost four point two billion dollars, something like that. I'm just so. So, how much do we spend on the military? Take all that budget and put it into the Death Star. That's what I wanted. But... So, or the NSA, <sighs> they, their budget is that much. Anyway, four hundred twenty thousand plus Facebook shares. I think that number talks to the average person. That means that mm -hmm. my mother saw it, my father saw it, my grandmother saw it, my cousin saw it. The people who – the 84,000 tweets, if you're on Twitter, you're probably more tech savvy. Yeah. So so 84,000 people saw it. I'm not worried about 84,000. I like more 420,000. Yeah, the – Facebook is definitely a wider reach, and more often than not. So on Twitter, it's a broadcast platform. So you're following people like, you know, celebrities or tech guys or people you want news from. Facebook is a more intimate connection. It's more people you actually know, family, friends, you know, coworkers, people you actually see on a, you know, yearly basis. So I think having a bigger number of Facebook shares really speaks volumes because people tend to care about Facebook traffic a lot more than they do tweets. I mean, a million people went to the site. I think that's, I think that's a big number. I don't think it's big enough, but I think that's a huge number. Remember, there's 320 yes. million people in the country, and so you take out, I don't know, 20 million or 30 million that are under the age of 18. But still, that's still, let's say, 300 million. We only got a million, but hopefully, those million people took action in some way. Yeah, we, we can only hope. And and really, um, so th this thing is technically the, the mass protest is over, um, but you can still call. You can still send emails. They've still got their the contact information up. So if you haven't yet, you know, go to the daywefightback.org and check out what they have there. Do some, do some reading, get yourself educated. And they've got, you know, two boxes here. They've got email your legislators. And you put in your email address, you hit next, and you hit go, and that's it. Or you can call if you want to spend, you know, it took me five minutes, only five minutes to get a hold of everyone who represented me in this country. And I put in my phone number, I hit go, and they called me. And it was that easy. So, yeah, the, the mass protest may be over, but your representatives are still working. You know, they're working today. They're working for you. You're paying them. So use them. Remember, what they do is they they listen to the number of people who call for and against. And remember, they always – so if the bill is in Congress for spying, then they want to hear how many against that we get. And if there is a lot of against, and a lot is a relative term, they'll, they make their decision what a lot is. And then they make their – then that's what they represent. So if five people call, okay, those five people are very passionate. What about the average person? If the average person doesn't call, then then they're going to assume that it's okay. That's why it's so important to let your voice be heard because a non non action means that you're okay with it. With anything, if they want to make you only drive American cars, if you don't call and complain, then they're going to say, okay. That's okay. That's what we're going to do. They want to raise your taxes. If you don't call and complain or email them or do whatever, they're going to assume that you're okay with it. So always, always, and don't assume that just because you're too busy to call that your neighbor will call. They're also too busy. Make the phone call. Everyone is too busy. And really, like I said before, it took me five minutes, just five minutes. I, I wait longer at coffee shops for my coffee. It, I mean, it's really easy. Really? Just while you're – get a whole group of people in a room, go on speakerphone, and all of you call. 
have a calling party. Have a that phone bank. That would be very efficient. A, there you go. They call you for everything else. They bother you at dinner. Think about all the survey calls that you get at dinner oh, time. Man. Same thing. They don't care. So If I get one more call from some political party wanting me to donate a dollar, I'm going to call and make myself known. So I don't have anything else on this other than rehashing what we spoke about. Do you? No, I think that's about it. I, I really, It'll be really interesting to see in the next couple months what happens with this and where these bills go. Because there's two bills. There's one that expands the NSA's power and legalizes it that the day we fight back has been fighting against. And then there's another bill by actually the guy who co-wrote the Patriot Act to curtail the NSA's powers and take it back because he said, I never meant for this to happen. I never meant for this law to be interpreted in, the, in this manner, and I have to stop it. So he wrote a new bill that kind of takes some of those powers away. And the day we fight back is for that bill. So there, there's some legislation that we need to see where it goes, and it's very interesting because uh, this this got some attention. Not as big as soap or pipa, but it got some big attention. So I have nothing else. The only question I have for Tom is how many days left on XP? Oh, man, uh, not Six, that many. 60, something like that? Yeah, it's like uh, two months, a little more than two months. Okay, you have 60 days, people. Windows 7, it's easy. It's great. It's fast. So, in 60 days, we'll have a podcast. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll pour beer out for XP <laughs> and say it's been, it's it's, uh, it's been bar mitzvah. It's now a man, <laughs> and it's time to move on. Okay, I have nothing else. Yep. So I say we wrap up. Well, see you guys. Have fun and stay secure. And for Harry Marks, it's 26 minutes and 40 seconds. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.